Okay, thank you. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, year's opening lecture of the Master in Media Power and, and Difference. Um, for me, it's an absolute privilege to be able to introduce uh, Professor Rosalind Gill, uh, who is our guest speaker today. Uh, Rosalind Gill is Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis at City University of London. So, uh, she worked uh, previously at the Center for Culture, Media and Creative Industries at King's College, London, also at the Open University, and also in the London School of Economics Gender Institute, among other uh, uh, universities. She has worked and published extensively about gender, media, sexuality, cultural work, and creative labor, uh, neoliberalism and subjectivity and new technologies. Her, her work has been very, very influential in uh, the fields of media and gender studies. Uh, it has been very, very uh, useful for uh, scholars uh, analyzing uh, all these uh, topics. And particularly, uh, her work on post-feminism uh, has been very, very, very influential. She has authored and edited several books, which include Gender and the Media, Theorizing Cultural Work, Aesthetic Labor, Beauty Politics in Neoliberalism, and Mediated Intimacy, Sex Advice in Media Culture, which is quite recent. Uh, it has, uh, it's very recent. And uh, she is also uh, the author of one of the key uh, articles that tackles this contradictory and complex concept that is uh, post-feminism, uh, is uh, this article that I would say that is the article about post-feminism, uh, post-feminist media culture, Elements of a Sensibility, which was published in 2007 in the European Journal of Cultural Studies, which uh, has uh, been cited more than 1,500 times. So that's uh, a lot, just a number I know, but, but I think that uh, it, it, it shows the, the importance of, of, of this, of, of her work. So in today's lecture, um, which is called Trending Now, the Complicated Life of Mediated Feminism, she will talk about uh, post-feminism and she will uh, explain why it's still relevant, this uh, concept, among other things, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Uh, so, thank you very much for being here. We are very excited to have you here, and we are uh, looking forward to, uh, to listening to your talk. Muchas gracias por uh, una muy generosa uh, presentación. Um, estoy uh, muy feliz de um, estar aquí. Um, Mi español es muy, muy malo, uh, así que tengo que hablar en inglés. Um, pero uh, muchas gracias por la invitación. Um, and now I will speak in English. <laughs> Phew. Um, which is very easy for me. I know it's not so easy for many of you. And I've made sure that I've got so much information on every slide and lots of pictures and lots of videos to, uh, because it's so hard. I know because I'm trying to learn Spanish and I know how hard it is to listen in a language that is not your first language. So after that very generous um, introduction, I, I can kind of skip the first few slides, which were just going to say a few things about what I've been up to. Um, but I think that the only important thing on this slide, really, is to say that all my work, whether I'm looking at gender, sexuality, media, labor, whatever I'm interested in, I'm fundamentally interested in questions about inequality, questions about social justice, and about the relationship between media and power, and the relationship between culture and subjectivity. So one of the things that I've struggled with my whole life and that still kind of gets me up in the morning is just thinking about this question of how it is that, that ideas that are out there in culture, in media, get inside us and actually get to form our subjectivity, get to shape um, all kinds of ideas and values that we have that we may think of as just personal, or idiosyncratic or individual, but which I think are deeply, deeply cultural. So I've been doing a few things around this. 
Um, but one of the, the things that is very precious to me is to challenge the whole myth of individualism um, in academia because uh, the greatest pleasure for me is to work with other people, to collaborate, and I've had the, the greatest opportunities to work with some incredible people and I'm really frightened with a list like this that I might forget somebody. That's my biggest fear that, you know, I've inadvertently left out my best friend or something like that. Oh, I hope not. But these are some of the, the people who are um, inspiring to work with and have been such a pleasure to work with. And I definitely think that academia is a conversation. I don't think it's about, you know, individuals um, sitting in a quiet room just typing. I think it's very much a conversation with other people and I hope that will extend to this room as well because I know uh, that I have so much to learn from you and I've already had some conversations just since being in the room that have made me realize, you know, things that I, I need to learn about and be informed on. So to the question, is this kind of pace okay, uh, uh, this pace of talking? So the question that I'm interested in um, really is this moment that we're, we're living in, and it's a moment where, as somebody who's written about post-feminism, it seems um, kind of paradoxical because we're living in a moment where feminism is everywhere. And when I'm talking to my students, sometimes I'm introducing post-feminism to them, and then I'm moving on to feminism now, and they're thinking, that's quite strange, isn't it, to have post something before you talk about the thing that it's supposed to be post. Um, but it seems like everywhere that we look, feminism is having a moment, as Jessica Valenti says, and as Sarah Bane Weiser says, everywhere you turn, there's an expression of feminism. It's on a T-shirt. It's in a movie. It's in a, a pop song. It's in uh, Instagram posts. It's in Oscar acceptance speeches. It seems like it's absolutely everywhere. And so for me, having written so much about post-feminism, about the repudiation of feminism, it's an interesting moment to be in, to think about this sudden new visibility of feminism again. And I kind of wanted to use today to ask, well, what does it mean and what's going on and what does this new mediated visibility of feminism look like? So um, I'm just going to get my phone so I don't go over time. So nobody wears watches anymore, including me. <laughs> so, yeah. Put it onto the clock. So, um, yeah, it's an amazing moment. Isn't it absolutely an incredible moment that we're living in? It's just, you know, you can't go online, you can't switch on the TV or radio, pick up a newspaper without seeing people desperate to identify themselves as feminists, really, really eager to claim that label of feminist. And for me, as someone so old that, you know, has lived through these times where... Um, it's been all about saying, I'm not a feminist, I'm disavowing a feminist, maybe I support equality, but I'm definitely not one of those. It's quite incredible to be in a moment where there's so many people who are eager to call themselves feminists. And it seems like it's become kind of every news interview, I'm not sure if it's the same here, but in the UK, every time you know an actor makes a new film and they go on the red carpet and they go and do their interview to promote the film or to promote their new book they're always asked would you call yourself a feminist and they always say yes i mean it's it's quite incredible one of my former phd students christina scharf um, in 2012 wrote a book called repudiating feminism and it was all about not being able to call yourself a feminist. So something's going on. Magazines are launching. The mainstream media is, is kind of eager to embrace this feminism. Um, magazines that you know, have always been very, very kind of m mainstream, very 
heteronormative, uh, very kind of conservative in their gender ideologies, suddenly having feminism issues. Um, even our, our newest member of the royal family, Meghan Markle, she guest edited Vogue magazine last month. And the, the whole issue is all about empowering women and how we need to get more women to feel more confident, how we need to help them into the workplace, help them into top jobs, albeit through things I consider a little bit problematic, like just you know having a really good capsule wardrobe or um, standing more confidently. But nevertheless, um, there's definitely this kind of zeitgeist, and it seems like you can't really go anywhere um, without encountering greetings cards, t-shirts, clothing lines, p people like wanting to identify as a feminist. So here's some examples. So we've got Elle magazine, its feminism issues, now quite well established. We've got um, the biggest media companies out there. We've got Netflix, like designing its algorithms because it wants to um, attract a kind of feminist um, viewership. So we've got movies featuring a strong female lead. We've now got you know, a special tag for all content that is directed by a woman. I mean, this is something is trending here when you've got your biggest media companies actually tagging their things by whether they're feminist or not. Spotify um, also does a similar thing with, with its female artists, and it's now instigated this thing called Feminist Fridays, which I don't really know uh, what that is, but I just think it's interesting as a, as a kind of response to this. Glossy kind of feminism is everywhere on TV. So um, does anybody know what the Bechdel test is? Does anyone know what that was? Uh, so this was, yes, one person, yeah, it did, yeah. So it was a test um, that was devised by a woman called Alison Bechdel um, at a moment where there were hardly any women in movies, or when they were there, they were just there as the kind of the girlfriend of the main male character. And so she instituted this test for people to apply in their everyday lives when they were just watching TV or going to the movies. And she said, how many times do you see a film where there's two or more female characters, where those female characters are not enemies, but they actually talk to each other, and they talk about something other than men and relationships. And I used to get my students to do this just a few years ago. I used to get them to like, go away and spend a week kind of consuming mainstream media and then see how many things actually passed the Bechdel test. And it was very, very hard for them to kind of scrape four or five programs or films that would pass that test. That's just a few years ago. Now we've got our media filled with glossy, big budget, multi-cast members, all of whom are women who are just holding the whole show. They're complicated characters. I mean, again, this feels like a really big shift to me. Um, and we have feminism in the news, so much so. Um, obviously, in the wake of, of Me Too, I mean, something like this, which um, I don't know if any of you watched it, it was Christine Blasey Ford's testimony um, against Brett Kavanaugh when he was going up to be a Supreme Court judge, and she was talking about her experience of sexual assault. It was virtually um, just live streamed on so many news channels. It was deeply, deeply moving. It was a very, very moving piece of testimony. And it definitely seems the case that at least some feminist issues are now making it onto news agendas. So we have a lot of talk about unequal pay. We now have our big companies have to complete an audit every year where they have to say, um, how they're paying their, their male and female staff. Um, they still use those kind of binary categories, cisgender categories, but um, at least it's a step forward that they're doing that. And every time there's an audit, there's huge discussion 
Um, there's discussion about violence against women, and there's especially discussion about sexual harassment, particularly since Me Too. So it seems like feminism's in the news as well. So there seems like there's so much that's good about this um, to me. Um, and it's very, very exciting to be in a moment where students want to do gender studies, want to do feminist studies, want to identify, are asking for more readings, want to go away and, and read things. They're reading Margaret Atwood, they're reading Marge Piercy, they're, going, they're reading Octavia Butler, they're going back to all these incredible feminist texts and reading them, novels, poetry, as well as academic texts. There's such an energy, but uh, I think there's a but here. And, and so I've divided my talk into kind of two types of buts. So my first kind of reservation, my first kind of ambivalence is what is this kind of masking? What is this kind of feel-good feminism, um, this sense of glossiness and um, things being visible and talked about, what's it actually mas masking? And I'm going to talk about inequality getting worse rather than better in parallel with this moment of feminism, about sexism being a huge structuring force, and also about misogyny becoming a really terrifying force. And then my second but um, is kind of a different but, and it's, it's something about but what kinds of feminism are getting visibility in the media? Which feminisms are becoming media friendly? Who gets to represent feminism? What is this new feminism like? Is it, is it intersectional feminism? Is it anti-capitalist feminism? Is it queer feminism? Or is it a kind of corporate, neoliberal, um, very palatable feminism? Um, can it be something more than just a kind of stylish identity on a t-shirt. Just one crucial note on this very, very bad slide, um, which is that I'm talking about mediated feminism, so I'm not talking about actual feminism here, I'm not talking about activism, um, people out on the streets, people in campaigns, in organisations. I'm talking about how feminism appears in the media. So the first, the first part of the but, then, is really about how persistent inequalities and injustice are. So in the UK, um, since 2008, since the kind of global financial crisis and the resulting austerity measures, women and other vulnerable people have been disproportionately affected by those cuts. They've been cuts to welfare benefits, there's been new taxes on housing, there's been huge, huge cuts to our whole women's sector. And it's kind of an irony when you've got this, you know, very upbeat, positive, glossy feminism in the media to realise that all the services that, you know, many, many people have fought for and defended over many years, services for women who've experienced domestic violence, services for women who've had um, sexual assault, women's health services, all these kinds of services massively, massively cut and under attack. Um, and, you know, other things happening that make it even harder. Um, also, the gender pay gap, despite, you know, its new visibility in the news, it's really severe. And it's been estimated by, you know, official sources, not, not by feminist organizations, but by official sources, that if the current rate of change continues, it will take around 100 years for women to achieve parity with men in terms of pay. This is in the UK. This is not such a, a great success story, I think. Um, we've got more and more women and children living in serious poverty. We've got dramatically increasing rates of of um, violence against women. And I think what's equally disturbing um, 
as well as that is that as the rates of violence are increasing very steeply, that the um, number of, of cases going to court is decreasing and the number of actual prosecutions is decreasing even faster. So despite Me Too, despite this sense that we're kind of living in a media which is saturated by feminist discourses where everyone's talking about the latest sexual harassment of a Hollywood star. Despite that, um, most sexual harassment is never even making it to a tribunal. And women are too, feeling too victimized, too fearful of losing their jobs in a very precarious moment to even, to even raise that. But um, the research shows that around 40% of women have, have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. Did anyone mention that I'm quite depressing to <laughs> be around? This is definitely me. Um, so as well as that, sexism is a huge issue, um, still a really big issue. And obviously, that's such a huge topic uh, that I just thought I'd just pick out one example of why it's still a huge issue. And this is an example Really, I want to just jump off from something that Angela McRobbie wrote 10 years ago. I think it was such an interesting and important argument that she made. And basically trying to think about patriarchy and think about what is patriarchy? You know, there's not a conspiracy. There's not, you know, a group of men sitting in a meeting room designing this with post-it notes and maps on the wall and thinking about how to crush women. Not at all. That's, patriarchy is nothing like that. And yet, it does have institutional and organizational forms. And it's kind of everywhere and yet nowhere. It's really hard to locate. And what Angela said, I think, so brilliantly was she said one place that we can really see it almost like sedimenting or territorializing itself is in the fashion beauty complex. And what she meant by that is that, you know, however many women are doing really well in the workplace, are making it into public life, there's still this sense of the body and physical appearance as being absolutely central. As Alison Winch has put it, managing the body is the means by which women acquire and display their cultural capital. And I think this has gone beyond um, objectification. I think there's sort of like an active surveillance of women's bodies in the media. And this is becoming more and more intense. And one of my brilliant PhD students, Anna Elias, talks about nano-surveillance. She talks about this form of surveillance of women's bodies becoming more and more intense and um, more and more focused, more and more forensic, more and more small. And, uh, and the way that we are invited to know our bodies through uh, pedagogy of defect. So we're invited to know ourselves through our failures, our faults. Um, I'll give you some examples to show what I mean. So this is the sort of thing I mean by forensic surveillance of learning to know yourself through a pedagogy of defect. And to me, this looks like, you know, an attractive, middle-aged, white, cisgender woman. What we're supposed to see there is like all of her faults, all of the things that are wrong with her, her face. Um, and everywhere we're seeing these kinds of images um, images of people measuring, well, women measuring their thighs, images of women uh, becoming detectives around their diet. I think, for me, this is like, or it should be like, science fiction. I mean, I really hope that one day we will look back on this moment and think, what was going on there? Like, our, and I see it here very visibly as well, that, you know, you walk around the streets there's so many images like this. I think I might have one here. There's so, so many images of aesthetic um, clinics. 
everywhere. It's like every other shop is an aesthetic clinic with these injections, with Botox, with these before and after shots. It's really a kind of intensive surveillance. And what's, what's the impact on women of that, of being invited to know ourselves through such a hostile gaze? I think it's, it's toxic. And hi there. And it's into that context that um, appearance apps, um, which is one of my interests, have arrived. And I've become really interested in these smartphone apps. You know, we're, we're all kind of, we're all addicted to our phones, aren't we? We're like, we've got them with us all the time. I did some research before with, with teenagers and they were all saying that, you know, they sleep with their phones. It's like literally the most intimate object in your life. Um, and onto those phones is this new proliferation of appearance tracking apps which track us, try and get us to improve and change and optimize ourselves. Um, and there's so many different apps. Just to quickly mention, obviously there's filters, which we all know about, um, how you filter your selfies or even your photos of other people to try and make yourself look thinner or curvier or taller or to have better skin or to have whiter teeth. Um, and research actually funded by Dove um, problematically found that it's very unusual for young people not to filter their images now before they upload them. And a quarter of the people that they surveyed um, who I think was 16 to 24, said that they spend at least five minutes per photograph um, changing things to make their photos look better. We've also got um, surgery tryout apps, again, building on the selfie uh, phenomenon. So you upload the selfie to this app and it tells you how you could look better with various kinds of surgery. So you know, you should have your teeth whitened, maybe you should have your eye bags removed, maybe you should have your whole face reshaped or your, um, uh, your face lifted. Um, and you get push notifications from the apps once you've done that once that they're GPS located. So as you find that you're walking through the city streets and you're passing a a cosmetic surgeon's clinic and you'll be getting a push notification with a, hey, fancy getting your teeth whitened now? We've got a two for one deal on. Um, so really kind of like quite invasive on this intimate technology. We've also got body scanning apps that are inviting us to scan our bodies. You know how you scan QR codes? To scan your body in that way as well. Like just, you know, check your thighs for cellulite, check around your mouth for smoking damage, check to see whether, you know, you've been in the sun, you've got skin damage, it might not show to the <laughs> naked eye, but check to see what's coming with all these solutions. Um, and you've also got appearance ratings apps that will you upload your photo and they give you a score on all kinds of things. How old do I look? How fat do I look? How sexy do I look? All these kinds of questions. They give you a, a score and then they give you um, some suggestions about what you could do. So this is just my one example of sexism um, and the sort of intense surveillance of women's bodies. I'm going to go faster over this, but um, I think there's also a really frightening rise of misogyny, um, and we've got our political leaders, you know, really spearheading that, talking about grabbing women by the pussy or not being worth raping. We've got major scandals. We've got rape culture and misogyny being named as kind of the most common feature of US campuses. We've got the rise of the kind of men's rights movement and a very networked misogyny online. And uh, according to Norton Symantec, who I mostly know just as an antivirus software company, they said that misogyny is now so widespread that it's actually become an established norm. Um, and it's there in public life, it's there on social media, it's there against journalists. 
So just quickly to say, the Guardian newspaper did an investigation of this. They were so worried about what was happening to their journalists once they went online and the, basically the comments that their journalists were getting. Really, really awful comments, death threats, torture threats, rape threats, vicious, vicious forms of, of trolling and serious threats against life and body. And so they did some research and they looked at 70 million comments that had been left on the Guardian newspaper website. Bearing in mind the Guardian is our most kind of liberal newspaper in the UK. So this is, this is not kind of looking at a right-wing paper. And they found that of the 10 journalists who were most likely to receive vicious trolling and hateful comments, eight of them were women and the other two were black men. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a huge, huge problem. Uh, I won't say any more about that. There's so many examples from the UK um, about politicians and I'll just say one thing about a woman called Gina Miller because she's been, she's a private citizen, but she's been incredibly important politically in challenging Brexit and challenging the lawfulness of it. And she now has to live with round the clock protection um, for herself and her family because her life has been threatened so authentically and credibly so many times and in so many different ways that she has to do that. Um, and just to mention also one of my other PhD students, Laura Thompson, is doing amazing work on um, misogyny on dating sites and, and that kind of intimate misogyny and the way that it becomes used in the wake of rejection that this kind of vicious trolling can happen. So quite depressing so far. <laughs> so that's kind of like the first half of what I wanted to say about why I'm a little bit kind of cautious about the sort of celebratory nature of um, this turn to feminism. Um, but I also wanted to just move on in the second part to just talk about well, what, what kinds of media visibility are there for which kinds of feminism? Um, so one question I have is whether or not mediated feminism is just corporate feminism. Um, is it a kind of corporate friendly feminism? I mean, advertising to women is full of feminist or pseudo-feminist messages today. It's all about breaking the rules. It's all about doing things differently. It's all about being defiant. Um, my beauty, my say. I can, so I did. Uh, these kinds of slogans. And I don't know if it was the same here, but on International Women's Day this year in March, it was absolutely extraordinary. It was a spectacle to see all these multinational corporations, big banks, huge supermarket chains, clothing brands, everybody like fighting to convey themselves as the most feminist brand and to convey the idea that they've been always supporting of women. But it feels like it has a kind of hollowed out quality. It feels like it's had all the politics emptied out of it, that it doesn't really have a uh, meaning. It's got a kind of positive tone. It's got this really sort of upbeat vernacular. And it's kind of like, we got you. You go, girl. I've got your back. You can do anything. This sort of um, very, very upbeat language. but. Is it, um, is it just a kind of corporate appropriation of feminism? I just want to show two examples of videos. Um, the first one, when I first saw this, I thought, thought it was a spoof. It's not. I'm worth it. You're worth it. We're all worth it. Famous words, I know, but L'Oreal Paris has always believed 
that everyone is worth it, whoever you are and wherever you're from. Championing inclusivity and diversity because what makes us different is what makes us beautiful. And when we feel our most beautiful, it gives us the confidence to strive to be the best that we can be so we can accomplish almost anything. But not if you feel invisible, forgotten or excluded just for being who you are. Then it takes more than just words to know your worth and to feel accepted. Embrace who you are and fulfill your potential. That's why L'Oreal Paris is proud to be a patron of the Prince's Trust. Helping young people across the UK transform self-doubt into self-worth. L'Oreal Paris will open the first all worth its space within the Prince's Trust <coughs> and roll out a confidence training programme available online and in all 18 centres. From interview training to employability, the course will help them recognise positive attitudes, behaviours and body language. Body language, very important. Look. Building self-worth for 10,000 young people. Supporting them will be me. And 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 me. So their journey to better can start right now. Because we're all worth it. Because we're all worth it. was a spoof when I first saw it because it seemed to so perfectly encapsulate this kind of <coughs> upbeat but essentially kind of hollow, empty kind of stress on self-worth and self-belief. Um, and I think it, it is, uh, these are all British celebrities of one kind or another, and I think it is really important that there's a more diverse range of people being shown. It's important that there's someone who's visibly disabled. It's very important in a climate of Islamophobia that there's a woman in a hijab. It's, it's um, important to see um, people of different ethnicities and to hear different regional accents. All those things are really important, but it seems like the video actually just stops at displaying those things and empties out the kind of meaning of those differences. So it's kind of a kind of post-race, post-feminist, kind of post-queer kind of video. It's, it's post-everything. Um, it's sort of emptied the meaning of, of all these categories out and it's as if the visibility is the politics. So you don't need to actually do anything because you've got this diversity displayed. I've got one other example I want to show you. Um, it's a little bit different. Um, see what you think. Hopefully this works. Remember these old Venus ads? With one version of beautiful skin in one white bikini. Well, things have changed. I'm a Venus. It's time to do things a new way, your way, without conforming to conventions, so that your skin writes the rules. Because no one gets an opinion on how you live your life or why you shave. So we're shaving the hair that you have in all the places it grows. And we're bringing it to life with a female-led team in front of and behind the camera. We're celebrating every woman and her skin. You're in control of your skin, how it looks and how it feels. My skin, my way. My way. My way. My skin, my way. YouTube. Yep. 
So I, I will ask you about this afterwards. I do want to know your thoughts on both of these videos, but I'll just kind of come to the end of the, the presentation. So I guess there's a question about what's happening here and whether this is just a kind of new commodification of ideas of autonomy, self-control, my skin, my way, your skin, your way, your hair, your way, your body, your, those sorts of ideas. And is it part of a kind of just wider tendency of woke capitalism in which it takes, corporate culture just takes radical ideas, empties them out and offers us um, them back. And this is a, a really bad photograph, but it's, it's one of a series of adverts that's been shown on the tube in London for many months now. It's for um, a, a housing block. It's for a new kind of uh, rented housing block. And all of, the, all of the posters are about rebellion. So this is like, rebelling never felt so chic. And there's rebelling never felt so stylish. Rebelling never felt so easy, which shows someone in the bath eating a salad, weirdly. Um, and um, yeah, they're, they're all about rebelling and how stylish that is. And I think it's quite interesting. You can just about see the logo. The company is called TP, but even the logo seems like it's kind of an appropriation of Extinction Rebellion's logo. It's so similar, um, but they're kind of buying into that. So it just seems to be uh, part of this sort of buying of feminism as a style, which you can make it mean whatever you want it to mean, because it's your choice. It's your way. Um, so corporate feminism, but also perhaps neoliberal feminism. Um, again, I would say it mostly appears in the media as a kind of individual ideology focused on getting ahead, rising to the top, achieving success very, very rare in all of the mediated feminism examples that I've looked at, of any sense that there's a collective struggle needed, um, let alone uh, any kind of critique of capitalism. Instead, it's all about working hard, being entrepreneurial, taking responsibility for yourself. Um, and yeah, it, it just seems to be about doing better and achieving more with less. And my last point is around how it's not just individualized, but I think it's also increasingly psychologized. So it becomes shifted away from collective struggle to individual hard work, but this is psychological labor. It's all about positive mental attitude. It's all about confidence, it's all about resilience, it's all about having the right positive attitude. Um, so I've been looking lately at a lot of um, sex and relationship advice and again and again the idea is addressed to women, the problem is you, you need to work on yourself, you need to have a mental makeover, you need to get over the things that are holding you back and these are these are internal things. This is not you know, social injustice. This is some sort of internal block. Um, and I've been looking with Shani Orgad and Laura Favaro and Akane Kanai, looking at how this sort of emphasis on the psychological, the emphasis on the dispositions that you need to survive and thrive in a neoliberal society is systematically not just displacing, but actually rewriting any kind of idea of social injustice or institutional inequality. It's just turning away from structures, organizations, institutions, and it's much more saying it's about what's wrong with women. So here's a few of the kind of what I would call the feeling rules of contemporary media culture, some of the key words that are around at the moment. It's all about boldness, isn't it? It's all about being bold. It's about breaking the rules. Also about being vulnerable and you know, being mindful and being woke and taking time out and meditating and having a positive mental attitude and working on your happiness and above all, self-care. It's about all of these things. Um, and these you know, ideas very much go with a kind of corporate emphasis. 
the conveniently not very challenging um, of, of neoliberal capitalism. Um, so these are some of the typical kind of arguments that we hear about why there is gender inequality in the workplace. It's like, women are too apologetic. They should just stop saying sorry. They need to be more assertive. They need to take up more space with their bodies. Um, they're using the wrong language. They're undermining themselves with their language, saying, I'm just, or I'm no expert. Or they're sabotaging themselves through perfectionism. Or they're not, they're not risk-taking enough. They're not taking enough risks. Or that they're bad at accepting criticism. These are the ideas that we hear again and again about why women are um, still in worse positions in society. Um, and what do they all have in common? Well, they all blame women. They make women responsible for inequality. They also say that this deficit is a personal deficit. And they place the responsibility on women to sort it out through endless psychological work. Um, and my latest research is around self-care apps. Um, I'm very interested in the kind of psychological labor that is called forth by these apps, which are telling us that you should change the way you speak, you should change the way you stand, you should change the way you hold your body, you should change the words you use. You should never say the word can't. You should always say challenge and not say problem. You should be your own friend. You should practice kindness. You could, should care for yourself. You should make sure that you're saying affirmations to yourself every day while you're cleaning your teeth. Tell yourself, I'm enough. I'm the best person at being me. You should keep a gratitude diary. You should write down things that you're thankful for at least once a day. You should get rid of your perfection <laughs> complex. You should be brave. You should take risks. You should make yourself vulnerable. You should dare to fail. You should be inspired. You should dance like nobody's watching. You should live, love, laugh. You should go confidently in the direction of your dreams. I just feel like it's everywhere, this kind of boldness, this kind of feminist-ish self-care discourse. Um, and to me, it's an appropriation of, oh, it's an appropriation of black feminism. But I just needed to, I was telling Noria this earlier that I was just getting dressed before to come here. And I was just pulling on these, just these leggings here, just these few ordinary leggings from a high street store. I was feeling a bit nervous because, you know, I'm in a foreign country. I don't know anybody. I didn't know how it was going to go. And I just pulled these on. And on the waistband, it said, if you believe in yourself, you can do anything. I was like, what? <laughs> Even my underwear is sending me these f feminist messages of capacity. This is incredible. But mostly it seems like self-care is appropriating what came from a kind of black feminist political movement and making it into a feminized commodity. So last year, Apple chose self-care as its, its trend of the year. It launched 3,000 new apps on mild, mindfulness, meditation, wellness, all of these things. Most of them were targeted at women. And it seems like what was a feminist act of political solidarity has been now appropriated into a disciplinary technology that involves yet more intense labor. For example, I've got the, the app Shine, which I do actually recommend. It's at least very interesting. It's worth downloading. I haven't gone for the premium version. I've just got the, the basic free version of it. But even though it's the free version, it still contacts me at least four times a day to check in with me, to make me listen to podcasts and do my gratitude journal and check in on how I'm feeling in real time with emojis. Um, it's just absolutely extraordinary the kind of labor involved in this. And this is a kind of disciplinary project. So, Overall, I think there's a real shift away from a kind of 
politics of feminism to an individual work on the self and a sort of compulsory positivity. Final slide. So what have I tried to do? I've tried to look at the media's contemporary love affair with feminism, welcomed it in some ways, but also raised some questions about it. Who gets to be visible? Whose issues, whose agendas get to have prominence? Is it actually challenging what we're seeing, the real increasing inequality, the sexism, the misogyny that are still out there and very brutal? Or is it a feminism that's been taken over by corporate interests, that it's uncritical of capitalism? Is it complicit with neoliberalism? Why does it persistently locate the causes of injustice and inequality in women's psyches, in our own heads? And what is this psychological turn doing to feminism and radical politics? And I think, yeah, probably guessed the answer here. I think that we need a feminism that is open, that's inclusive, that sees gender as connected to other struggles to do with class, race, sexuality, disability, also climate change, um, and also to capitalism. And I'm not totally sure that this new mediated feminism is getting us closer. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, talk. We will now open the floor for questions. It's very loud. And, and I will ask you to use the mic because we are recording this. So, uh, no? I have a question if, ah, okay. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm really excited to, to listen to you today. I just wanted to, to make like a comment in relation that with what you already said. I'm sort, I'm, my research is related to music. And in some way, it's really interesting to see how feminism is also getting appropriation in different genres of music. So it's like you have rap and you have feminist rap. If you have reggaeton and you have feminist reggaeton. I don't know what you think about that because it's it's it seems to me that it's more like this cliche of of tagging everything as feminism in order to I don't know approach women or something, and and therefore the attitudes or the representations in the videos, for instance, are quite similar uh, uh, in about uh, like the presentations that used to be made by men. So I'm just interested in your opinion related to music and this kind of differences because of a gender, gender perspective. That is really interesting. Thank you for the question. I, yeah, I haven't really thought about that before, and I don't really know. But I think it's very, very interesting always when you get a genre, and it's like the genre is kind of perceived to be mainly male. And then you get this kind of corner where you're allowed to have a women's version of it, or in this case, a feminist version of it. And it's almost like it's not good enough or it's not kind of there enough to join the main genre and actually just be, you know, rap rather than feminist rap. Um, so that seems really problematic. But are you saying that the, the representations of women in, say, feminist rap are similar to the ones in male rap as well, mainstream rap? Yeah, I mean, you have this difference about like, what are you, you, you're listening, you know, if you select a rap song of a masculine singer, then it's rap. If you listen to a rap song of, of with a different, with a, with a message that contains disempowerment or something like that, then is a feminism rap. But in the representation, more or less is the same about, for instance, the sexualization of women. The sexualization is still present, of course, in the rap, uh, the, the misogynist rap, usually, you know, um, but also in this new way of feminism. So it's like, or, or this new way of rap feminism. So it's like, just this tag changes the message 
and the lyrics maybe in some way, but there is still this representation of women trying to be, you know, attractive and always with these explicit all allusions and scenes where you are showing your breast or your butt or something like that. So in some way, the difference to me is that maybe the lyrics are quite different and just in some exceptions, but it's mostly the same way of sexism, but just tagged with this feminism uh, level, you know? Wow, how interesting, gosh, that's, yeah, interesting and depressing, and what interesting <laughs> research. <laughs> I'd love to talk to you more about it. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, you talked about uh, big tech companies and banks that are trying to uh, support more feminism but are not quite grasping it yet. Do you think there are some companies that are able to do it and why? That's such a good question. Um, yeah, I've had to sort of think about this um, a little bit more deeply recently, actually in the wake of Pride um, in June, because um, there were a lot of people criticizing the kind of way that, um, you know, all the, you know, the big airlines, the big banks, the big multinational companies were um, appropriating rainbow flags and kind of making themselves seem like they're the most progressive um, companies in terms of their sort of sexuality politics. And there were a, a lot of people, I guess, with a similar kind of perspective to me who were very, very um, critical of that and quite cynical about that as a sort of empty, cynical gesture um, just to make themselves look look cool in this, in, in this moment where that could, could be cool. And then there was a really interesting debate on Twitter from people, some people actually who worked in one of the big banks saying, why, why are you so critical? Do you know that I, you know, I work inside this organization and I really struggled to get this organization to do something that would have some meaning in relation to this. And now it's kind of going out there and all you kind of progressive academics are just knocking it down. So I feel like there's a real parallel with, with feminism there. It's just that it feels like it's so hollow. It feels like it's so empty and um, that it could, ch it could change in a moment and, and go back to something really re regressive if that became you know, the new marketing trend. But, but what do you think? Uh, I just feel like a lot of big companies do it because the others do it. And it seems like you can't be the only one that doesn't do it because it seems like you're anti-women or anti-feminism. So I'm just wondering how you thought about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really difficult, it's a really difficult one, isn't it? And what, like, some sort of authentic change would actually look like. Hi. Um, my question is kind of, I know probably it has no answers at all, but <laughs> when do you think, as a scholar specialized in, in that subject, when do you think we can start talking or thinking about post-feminists in history or in theoretical history, you know? When are we going to stop yeah. talking about it? No, or start. 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 Yeah. Like because we were really discussing that with Pilar and another uh, professor the other day. Like, we were thinking that maybe in this, you know, wave of postmodernists, post post-structuralists, uh, people start to look at the sub critical subjects that uh, used to, um, and then, like, really dissection it in little uh, parts, and then it. A kind of loose sense in the whole, and kind of post-feminist is something like looking too much into individual and forget the 
whole society. So I was just wanted to know what's your opinion in that. I'm not sure I've totally understood the question, but I think I think my answer is kind of I think this stuff is so complicated and um, you know, when I started writing about post-feminism a while ago, I was really, really clear not to kind of have it in a historical perspective, that I didn't want it to just seem like it was some sort of linear trend and that we'd moved from this phase to this new phase, but rather to think about it as a sort of sensibility or a set of ideas and, and feelings um, and moods and and re representations and I think that's what I still sort of feel now in a way because I've been sitting with my friends Sarah Bane Weiser and Catherine Rottenberg which is our little awesome feminist community in London um, and we've been you know really struggling over all of these questions and we've been trying to think about like how do you name this moment like, is this like popular feminism? Is it neoliberal feminism? Is it actually post-feminism in a new kind of feminist clothing? It feels so difficult. And I, oh, I just always struggle because it feels like everything is mixed up with everything else all the time. Um, and I think it comes to what you were saying also around the fourth wave feminism and, you know. We were also I'm thinking that maybe, you know, with Mm, like all the union stuff start to dissolve and like also the political movements start to look more into the individual and you know try like you can even wear your feminist or your uh, activism as a costume and then forget to think about society so at the end of, of the 80s or something like that so you know it's just I think it's like the this kind of Western logic of trying to look for a start and develop and an end. So yeah, I was just wanted to know what's your opinion about that. Oh, that Thank is you. so interesting. Yeah. I really want to talk more about this and hear more about your research. Yes, yeah, I have a question also. Uh, if I <laughs> uh, while the mic uh, goes there. Um, yes, because I mean, um, um, Continuing with the, this idea of the relationship between post-feminism and this moment of uh, mediated feminism, um, do you think are compatible? Or maybe this uh, this this new mediated feminism is a new. I mean, it's post. It, it's also post-feminist in the sense that I mean, with post-feminism, there was this idea that uh, feminism is no longer needed, and now we are talking all the time about feminism. But at the same time, there are these continuing themes. I mean, the endless work on the self, the, the focus on the body. So there are a, a lot of themes of, of topics that are pretty much there, that are very similar to, to the, the key elements and concepts of post-feminism. Also, the, the focus on neoliberalism, which is what maybe it's the, the connection there. So, how do you think these two concepts work together? I mean, this new era uh, of mediated, uh, mediated feminism and the more, uh, I mean, 90s or early 2000s definition of post-feminism. Mm. Do you think are con mm. compatible? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, I, I, I think it's really, um, there are so, so many synergies and overlaps. Um, <laughs> in my most kind of like despairing moments at <laughs> three o'clock in the morning, um, I just think that this is almost like if you wanted to create a sort of cynical way of not having to change anything at all, um, then you could rebrand post-feminism with a kind of feminist gloss. And wouldn't that work effectively? Because it would do the same ideological work of you know denying structures denying the need for collective change but all the while with a kind of more of a feminist gloss to it but that's probably like a bit cynical and i think there's you know there's what do you think yeah i don't know um because of course the political language i think it has changed and of course when we talk about feminism you use 
talk about a very politically charged uh, concept that, that has to do with structures and with structural inequality. But it's true that uh, in the way that it's used and in this context, context of corporate uh, feminism, it seems like a rebranding. Maybe it, it's interesting, this idea of rebranding of, uh, of post feminism. I think it's, it's quite interesting. And I, I don't know, I, I was, I'm sorry, and I will keep it short. <laughs> sorry, because I was talking about this topic uh, in, in, my under, in one of my undergraduate course, and for my students, they see, they, they see all, all these uh, like all the same. I mean, this, mm, this new feminism and the post feminist, post feminist culture, they saw this continuity. I mean, they didn't see this uh, really different uh, culture. So, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a little question. Uh, thanks a lot, first of all, for your presentation. It was really interesting. And I am from Ukraine, and uh, you know, <laughs> this topic is um, uh, is a little bit new for me. Uh, uh, not very new, but uh, we have another uh, 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 an, an vision of uh, all this fem feminism discussion. So um, we can like or dislike uh, all this uh, using of feminist feminist conception by big corporations or public persons, politicians. But anyway, it is some kind of discussion. It's some kind when we talk about this in Ukraine, we we even don't talk in this way. You know, we feel a lack of even such kind of information. So maybe it is not so evil uh, if uh, this big corporation using this concept of feminism. Uh, I would like to hear your answer. <laughs> Thank you. That's such an important point. Thank you for that. Yeah, and it's yeah, that's that's so so good to actually contextualize this as just you know one um, one kind of spatial and national kind of context or you know um, transnational but not global and to think about yeah to think about places where feminism or gender inequality is not even being spoken about at all is yeah is really really yeah Yeah, thank you. I'm really, I'm really, really glad that you, you talked about that. I mean, it's interesting to think about, like, the different possibilities for what we can do in both scenarios, really, isn't it? Because it's sort of like the scenario that we're in, that I've been talking about. Um, it's kind of, it's here, the, there's a discourse here, and it's filled in a particular way, or it's shaped in a particular way, but at least there's a chance to actually, you know, refill it in another way or try and re-signify um, or contest it but there's also a possibility i guess from emptiness as well that if there's nothing there there's also the possibility to kind of create a new a new feminist discourse that hasn't got the kind of contamination if you like of of all these corporate discourses so yeah i think it's really it's such an open question yeah, <laughs> it couldn't be a problem. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask your opinion on a feeling I usually have, like regarding the post-feminist discourse, and it's like I just feel like it's usually the discourse is very, very compatible with the sexist discourse, and I see it like very frequently in uh, pop culture. And uh, for example, coming back to the, the records on example or like music or films, like the male version of the reggaeton would sound something like, oh, like we are in the disco and there's this pretty girl and she's unsatisfied 
and uh, she wants me, let's have sex. But then you see the counterpart that will be like the uh, empowered female reggaeton that will be exactly the same, but the opposite way. It would be like, I'm an empowered female and I enjoy my sexuality and uh, uh, I like sex and you want me and I know it and, and uh, let's have sex. But it's, it's <laughs> so it's like, it's like a self, uh, you know, like you, yeah. just, you just take the same discourse, but you make it look like it's the female, the one that wants it now. So now it's fine. Yeah. I, I just feel brilliant. that all the time. <laughs> what a brilliant way of summing it up. That's so good. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what to say. That's so spot on, <laughs> so really. <laughs> and I could see uh, quite a few people all around the room kind of yeah, nodding. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it and I really liked the examples. Um, I just, you brought up a few memories for me and I wondered whether um, you could maybe put them in context. Um, so I grew up in the 90s, so I remember when feminism was kind of a bad word. Um, but then when I was a teenager in the early 2000s, I remember reading these books um, called Girlosophy. And they, the content of these books w was very similar to the kind of glossy feminism that you've talked about. And so I'm wondering whether that was kind of the beginning of this kind of kind of, uh, you know, wave of feminism. Um, but the only thing is, these books for me weren't, weren't feminist. They didn't have that label feminist and they weren't kind of sold in that way. So I'm wondering whether the content now is the same but rebranded or the content's actually been kind of transformed and rewritten in some mm. way. Mm. How interesting. What did you say the books were called? Uh, Girlosophy. Girlosophy. Yeah, they're, I'm Australian, oh. so and I think they're by an Australian writer. Oh, <laughs> so maybe right. Not. <laughs> were they anything like the kind of girl power? Um, was it anything like that moment? No, it was more like um, lots of kind of photos of healthy women, um, um, kind of tips on how to feel good about yourself. Um, you know, how to improve yourself, how to be happy, a little bit kind of, I guess, new age and spiritual, um, but at the same time, you know, had a lot of content that, that you would find in a girls' magazine um, mm. about body and, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting example. I haven't heard of them before. I'll, I'll go and Google them later, of course. Um, but yeah, I do. I suppose it just comes down to that same thing about it's so hard to like write a kind of smooth history of this that you know that that those it's like none of the ideas that I've spoken about today are new. Uh, they've all been around forever, not not forever, but for a, for a, you know since the 1960s. And you could say all of the self care stuff is very much you know that sort of. Um, you know, age of narcissism kind of whole being thing from the 60s and that it's kind of just been picked up and intensified now. And likewise, it sounds like there are themes that were going on there that again have become, as you say, rebranded and kind of there much more prevalently now. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I have a lot of ideas. I, 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 I need time to, to think and to refresh. But as a psychologist, um, um, I think that for, for me, one of the most dangerous of this type of message, messages is around how they construct internal subjectivities and uh, construct subjectivities and emotions. And perhaps in the past, you can, uh, perhaps you, you could hurt a lot of women uh, around uh, guilty style. I feel guilty, I feel guilty, I feel guilty. And now, 
I think that this type, this kind of necessities are constructing a different type of guilty around the cynical point of empowerment as self-esteem. Uh, but in some way, I continue hearing uh, guilty and anxiety about, uh, I, uh, in some way, you, you, I think you, you, you are talking more or less the same, that I, I have to be uh, powerful, I have to be very positive, <coughs> I have to smile, mm. I, I have to be strong, I have to be with, um, with courage, with, I have to be brave. Mm. Uh, you have no time, you, you can't complain. You can't blame. And everything remains in some way. Yeah. And I, 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 I see, I, I am very interested in, in this kind of the the um, actually it's not a question, it's just a comment. The psychological effects, the, the emotional effects of this kind of messages that, that they think there in some point there are very cynical in their souls. Mm -hmm. But in the previous system, in the previous patriarchy, uh, more or less um, you, the, the message was clear. You have to feel bad because you are guilty. You are guilty of that. But in, in this time, I think that John perhaps is a confusion and Hiro was more or less saying the same. Uh, we are <coughs> changing the scenario and now you want to be an empowered woman. Yeah. But the, the system remains mm. and nothing is changed. Mm. But you feel happy. Because you, you have the power. I'm calm, calm. <laughs> so, so it's yeah. horrible. Yeah. I feel depressed like this. I, 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 I feel, I feel yes. it's, 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 more, it's, it's more dangerous. Because, yeah. uh, well, sorry, I, I don't know yeah. if you agree or what. Oh, I agree 100%. I think that's absolutely brilliant. I'm ex interested in exactly those things. Yeah, what that does, the suppression of... Um, any entitlement to feel anything negative is so dangerous and it's so chilling. What a kind of totalitarian thing to do to a human being um, to give, make you be compulsorily positive and not allow you to actually feel what you feel and to pathologize anger, to pathologize complaint. I, I, yeah, I'm, I find this psychological turn even though, and even particularly because it's branded in such a kind of caring way, is really toxic, really yeah. frightening. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your talk. And also I want to thank you for, the, for, for addressing the term post-feminism. Post because personally, it's been very useful to understand many, many things concerning your research topic, and well, people who research the same, the same thing, well, find how, find it useful. Uh, well, more than a question, I would like to make a reflection about all the topics people have uh, discussed today, and is, um, I think, I mean, um, the market and corporations have made it again and have made it very very attractive, have made it very fascinating. I mean, feminism has success, and as a consequence, well, we can, we can really see it in, on screens, we can really see it in the media. But the question is, um, well, not the question, the reflection is, when we researchers, scholars, are going to make a switch in the perspective, we broadened this object of a study, because all the time when we study uh, from gender perspective, gender studies, well, the body studies, I, this is my research line, the body, so you can perfectly know how important is the gender theory and feminism. But the way is, the thing is that we are not constructing critical uh, methods or critical concepts or critical perspectives to try to see, at least in media, the way uh, bodies, uh, gender is represented. So when I arrived to your papers and other, other papers, of course, so I, I really found that there's, there's this need to understand 
all of the gender issues, not only for a, from a question of representation, but from a political point of influence. So in this way, I think it's not only about studying gender from trying to know what's to be a man or what's to be a woman. It's trying to know the social implications it has, this, the phenomenon has. So, uh, well, this is a, a thing I just wanted to comment. Um, I, I think, thanks so much for the comment. I think I, I think I, when you were speaking, I thought that you were sort of saying that we need to kind of move on from critique and that in a way that, you know, you hear this critique again and again, but actually the challenge is to, to do something different, to actually like turn our critique into something, to kind of materialize something in new ways. But then by the time you finished speaking, I thought, no, I've got that completely wrong. That wasn't what he was saying. So prob yeah, 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 it was exactly like, uh, well, at least we researchers, we, we need to problematize what we found on these issues. I mean, yeah, we need to try to, we need to go in the same way with the market. We cannot be on the other way of the market, or we cannot be aligned with the market. Because on the other way, we won't see what is happening there. I mean, market, well, corporations, advertising, you have a very interesting paper about advertising and post-feminism in advertising. Advertising has taught many interesting things to us about feminism, first point. Mm -hmm. Second, but in this way, advertising has taught us about feminism, has also introduced this, this um, negative way to, to uh, this negative, um, yeah, has, has, has negative consequences on, 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 female, on, on women. So it's like, uh, yeah, what I want to say is like, uh, when are we, scholars, academics, going to start thinking in a critical way about these issues? Because, well, not only scholars, I mean also politicians, you know, when making like public policies is the same. Like, uh, we don't really see that uh, all media policies these inclusive policies are not solving the issue. You know, like uh, now bringing to agenda feminism is not really going to solve the social inequalities. This. Wow, I think, that, I think there might be too much <laughs> to address here, actually. That's so huge. That's such a kind of huge um, provocation in a way. But I would just say one thing, because I sort of feel like I've got Angela McRobbie in my head in a way at this moment. And I know what she'd say is like, feminists are in advertising agencies. <laughs> she'd be saying, look, I've been at Goldsmiths teaching all these guys and they're going out and getting jobs in all the advertising agencies and they're, they're there already and they're doing, they're doing stuff. So I, I don't think, she, I think, you know, with her in my head, I'd say there's not such a clear um, binary, but I think you've raised a lot of other issues that yeah, possibly <laughs> too huge, but thanks for them. Okay, we have time for one more question, maybe over there. It's a much less sophisticated question. <laughs> uh, it, I'm just very curious about something. What do you think about inclusive toilets? Oh my God. <laughs> Um, do you know what? This might be going to the, the top of my list of most difficult questions that I've ever been asked, seriously. Um, and I thought the previous, the previous holder of that, of that trophy was um, a question about um, wear, wearing a wonder bra. And the question was, can you be a feminist and wear a wonder bra, which was one of those bras from the 90s that pushed, pushed you up. Um, but I think, yeah, this question about toilets is also, is really, really um, a difficult one. I mean, obviously I support the, um, the argument to have them um, uh, completely um, behind trans rights and non-binary rights and I realize how much oppression and discrimination and harm is enacted through the humble room of the toilet. So I'm completely for it. On the other hand, I have to say honestly that 
for me as a cisgender woman, I would quite like to use a toilet to have a space that I could go into that I knew uh, would be uh, uh, for women. So I think it's, it's, yeah, I think it's a really complicated question. What do you think? Why did you ask? <laughs> No, I ask. I mean, I would. I guess I would answer the same uh, you did, because uh, on the one hand, yes, it's more inclusive for non for people who identify with non-binary genders. But on the other hand, it's also it can also be a potential space where you can, where sexual harassment can be committed with total impunity. Impunity, you know. Uh, more, I mean, more easily. Obviously, if you, you know, uh, sexual harassment or assault can happen any any anyway, but it's probably easier. I don't know. Thank you for your consideration anyway. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I think that our staff explained and talked about the bathroom question that our staff and the mic. The mic, otherwise the recording one. This <laughs> 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 Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Gill, for being here. <laughs> and for this fantastic uh, lecture, and thank you all for, for being here also. <laughs>